Good afternoon, welcome to EduSet Network. Friend, as you know, we are discussing informal sector. Today, we will try to know what is informal sector and how it contributes to our economy. As you know, the informal sector contribution is uh, increasing wide every day and it has also gone and see change after the globalization. So, we will try to look at the various aspects of informal sector and for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio Dr. Satish Kumar. He teaches political science and a known columnist writer on social economic issue in different newspapers and journals. So, I hope his knowledge and experience will help us to understand the informal sectors in a new perspective. So, on your behalf, I welcome Dr. Kumar for EduSet lecture. Welcome, you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Today, we will try to uh, identify the status of informal sector in India in a specific terms and how does it promote the Indian economy which is for the last few years is going to be and it has people, the leaders of the other world recognize that is the second fastest economy of the world and going to be the fourth largest economy of the world. But its contributions in its speed come from the informal sector. But the status of informal sector, not only in India, but throughout the world, is a very disturbing. The kind of security in which it covers for the larger section of the society is very poor. The legal as well as social safety needs for the informal workers are almost negligible. During the course, we will also discuss about the Social Security Act of 2008, how it has been an attempt by the government to identify the issues concerning the informal sector and formal workers. So, for a better understanding of the inform informal sector, let us differentiate between the formal as well as the informal sector. Formal sector which comes, whatever, whatever uh, 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 the way it has been run, it's a, it's a, it's a procedure, it's a benefit, or, and uh, almost everything is mentioned in the Indian rules, and uh, the budget accumulation, the, the, uh, the way the budget is being analyzed, it comes under that parameter. But the percentage of formal sector in India is less than 10 percent if we analyze in the number of the workers in India. But the numbers of informal sector in India is almost more than 90 percent, 93 percent almost. The same kind of situations more or less prevalent in the developing world, whether it is the Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, our South East Asia, the share in the field of uh, labor market which come from the informal sector. Then what is the informal sector? The informal sector, to have a better understanding, it is a self-motivated contributions by an individual or by a group of individuals which is run by a family. Let's take an example of vegetable vendor. A vendor uh, picks up the vegetables from the mandi and sells door to door in the particular area. In his uh, uh, professions, it may be possible that his family members 
his daughter, son, wife and other could be involved. Likewise, there are many other factors in which this society where we live, we take the advantage of the labor of that particular individual comes under the informal sector. We see Rediwala, we see a different kind of, we, we, in every city, in every colony you might have seen the labor job, where a large number of laborers, they gather and they sell themselves for that particular day on certain price. People, those who need them, they hire them for a day, our few days, and they pay them accordingly. So they also come under the informal sector. There could be some differences if we see the socio-economic factors at the village level and at the urban level. But more or less their status are same. What are the major problems of the informal sector they face. There are a number of problems if we analyze. There are economic problems, social security, legal problems, and irrespective of other problems which continue to haunt a marginalized section of the society. So we will try to come one by one and, uh, uh, and we also try to see the existing schemes which are being run by the government of India, by the state governments and how does it address the problems of the informal sector. So for the understanding of the informal sector, it is very huge and large and uh, its contribution uh, to the economy is, is immense, but their social and economic status of that particular group is very poor. And why it is poor, we will also try to identify the regions. We might have heard about the microfinance. We will also try to identify how the uh, an NGO, our social society, uh, uh, social organizations, they try to address the problems of the informal sector. How does the Grameen Bank of Bangladesh uh, become the largest bank of not only the Bangladesh, but uh, uh, in, in, in South, uh, South Asia. And that is uh, the minimal contributions by the workers of the informal sector. In India, SEVA, Self-Employed Women Associations, is another glaring example in which the contributions of the informal workers make it a huge organizations. So these are the factors which we will try to uh, uh, come one by one. But let us first identify the major problems of the social sector, uh, informal sector. When we uh, try to identify the problems, we see that the person who works from 7 a.m. to till 9 a.m. and uh, 9 p.m. then there is always a likelihood of that person to uh, become old before his age. There is no need to identify and check out the existing malaise of, of our socio-economic situations. The dai, the maid which come to your house, you might have seen. There is a there is a cycle of uh, there is a, there is a cycle of poverty. 
a young maid come to your house at the age of 22 to 23. She picked up so many works. She goes to many houses. When she has a little daughter of 7 to 8 years, she introduces her daughter to other family members and gradually she also picks up and contributes in helping out her mother. And within a couple of years, she, the daughter becomes a full-fledged maid. Their dieting system, their other uh, input which they require are almost missing. So what happens? By the age of 40 or 45, the maid reaches, she becomes the victim of a major disease and her daughter adopts the same professions which she has already been trained at the age of 7 to 8. And this cycle of poverty continues for generations. This is one example which I am giving, which I have given you. In the same, in the industries, our, our the daily wages workers, whether it is urban vendors, our, uh, the people, those who are in the informal sector, they face the same kind of problems. Their existence are always at risk. So, the, the major problem is economy. And it is not only, it is not only the problem of uh, disease and sickness, the problem of economic insecurity. You might, if you visit the labor chalk, where the uh, uh, laborers conglomerate for being sold, you, every day you might have seen a few laborers, they have not been picked up. So their service was not being used. The vendors, there is a competition among the vendors. In a particular road and lane, there was only one vendor. Now there, there are more than three, four vendors in the same lane. They sell the vegetables. So their vegetables are not being sold. And as we all know that, the informal workers, they do the business of quite often of perishable items. Means if vegetables like a tomato or mushrooms or this kind of vegetables is being not sold by late evening, then what will happen? They do not have the cold storage. They do not have the system where they can freeze and protect their goods. So by tomorrow morning it will become useless. So it is also a threat, a threat of losing the money. We will also, uh, when we will discuss about the factors of globalization and liberalization, uh, we will also identify how the big companies are hampering the interest of the informal sector. But let us, uh, I didn't, uh, let us see uh, that the major threat of the informal sector is economics. And that begins with the job security. When we are in the formal sector, we have a number of guarantees. We, we, we take the advantage of a uh, number of schemes which are being run by the government. We have the job security. We have the confidence. and social and economic factors are also uh, in favor of the of formal sector. But informal sector, they almost miss out from these advantages. They remain standing on the risk. So any, any a minor push can eliminate the life of not only one individual, but complete hog of the family and they come under a distress. So if this problem is to be addressed properly, then central as well as state government need to regulate 
economic security to the individual. Forget about the social security. Social security comes later. When there is no economic security of existence, then they are not in position to invest even a rupee on the social security. Or needless to talk about the insurance, another. They, they, they say that it is for the rich people. It is, it is for the people, those who have a lot of money. So, the problem is economics. The problem is of regular getting the job, getting the work at the right time. If it is not done, then they remain at risk. Second problem, which is also related with the economy, economy of that informal sector, is social insecurity. They live in a society as, as we do, but quite a number of times this society is remained to be hostile to the informal sector. They always visualize and perceive the workers of the informal sector with suspicions. They are doing not a proper job. We are giving too much money to the worker. They take advantage of others. Even, even if you see, if you hire a labor for your family for a day, then we always want to see him working from 9 to 6 p.m. Even for five minutes, if he takes break, we become so aggressive. Hey, what are you doing? Please go and work. that shows the mindset of our society. And it happens because they are ultimately at very adverse situations. They are facing the adverse socio-economic conditions. If you do not hire, if they do not behave properly, you may not hire them next time. So this kind of problems which remain in their mind and that also affect the workers. Third problem, as we all know that if you analyze the social sec informal sector, we identify that it is children and women centric. In majority of the people, those who are involved in informal sectors are women and children and they are more vulnerable. They have certain limitations. A child cannot lift more than 15 to 20 kgs of weight, but sometimes he is being forced by employer to do so. Women are more vulnerable in, because of the different other regions. Sometimes they are also physically exploited by the employer. So, I, I, what I am trying to focus is how vulnerable are the informal sector in India. And later on we will try to uh, also discuss the positive factors of informal sector in India, how the rules being framed by the government of India and how does, uh, uh, what are the uh, loop, loopholes, what are the major factors which prevent the government in, 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 in successfully implementing these laws. So we will also come uh, after that. But for the basic 
understanding of the informal sector, we, we should be very clear that their problem is economy. Their problem is job opportunities. If they have the job, they can earn, they are willing to work. They are very hard working. They can migrate from one place to another. You also see that because of the lack of work, quite a number of people, they migrate from poorer states to the prospering cities of India. And this is another problem which has generated in Indian socio-economic milieu. Tribal people, they pick up the woods and leaves which are fallen from the tree and they sell it in the market and they earn less than 20 to 25 rupees a day. Is it possible that a, an individual who is earning less than 20 rupees can survive in this country? The way eaten goods uh, and other things have become costly and it is costly for them as well. So how is it possible that the poorer, the poorest of the poorer can live and survive? I can give you one, one of the very glaring examples, very interesting examples. As we all know that under the schemes of the government, Government shops are being opened in each and every block and, uh, of India. And the food and eatable items are being distributed to the poorest of the poorer on the basis of red card, green card and other. So below the poverty line and below the poverty line is, there is also two categories, the extreme uh, poor, they identify by the assets of an individual and family. So what happens? While interacting with the many laborers in uh, Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand and Bihar, they, they say, Ki, why don't you buy the eatable items from the government shops, which is, uh, which is based on the subsidies. So it is very cheap. They say the, it is very difficult for us to buy. Why? Because from morning 7 to 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., they are out of the house and they are in the different fields. They are in the, they are in the workplace. So it is not feasible for them to miss out the work and buy the items. The second problem they analyze that they have the system to buy 5 kg of rice at a time. And 5 kg rice means more than 50 to 60 rupees. So we do not have so much money at a time to buy the rice or sugar or whatever are available in that shops. So the schemes the benefits, the subsidies which are being provided by the government are not picked up and utilized by the communities for which this scheme was made. Then how can we see and how do we expect that the poorer, the poorest of the poorer would come out and feel happy. So, the, the economist could analyze this fact that glazing India, signing India, which is being seen in Delhi and NCR and other uh, cosmopolitan and metropolitan cities, do not exist in 
far flung areas where the major chunk of the population more than 73% of the population they live over the even in the cities where the largest section of the city which is populated by an extremely poorest of the poor people in india they are not they are not equally happy as the 10 to 15% population of this country are so the division are very clear cut the signing india is for the 10% population for the 10% population of this country but 90% still feel dismayed they are disturbed and we will be surprised to know that in the mountainous terrain the tribal people those who uh, come to pick up the work they come down from a two to five kilometers from the mountain to uh, to the field and again they pick uh, they take the burden of going to the mountain of 5 to 7 kilometers on the mountain in the night because there is no work in the mountain there is no development the work is done on the paper for majority of the people the tribal people or scheduled caste or the people who are extremely poor they have to walk down from the top to the field to pick up the work so is it possible for an individual to work 8 to 10 10 hours and again walk for another 3 hours to reach their house and what will happen to the person after Five to six years, so these are the challenges. These are the threats, and these are the ground reality of our country, in which the signing India or the industries, uh, the name of the country, which is being sold inside and out outside, are. been contributed by the informal sector which constitute more than 93% of our workforce so it has to be seen in that perspective now let us see threat perceptions for the informal sector informal sector workers natural calamities in any of the natural calamities whether it is latour earthquake in which thousands of the people were being killed or it is a flood in bihar which occurred 3 years ago which was categorized as a kosi episode in which the villages number of villages were being swept away by the current and it converted lakhs of the people homeless and what happened after that if you visit the sites you might have seen on the tv but if you visit the site you will find that number of people they are living homeless even after the 3 years of this natural calamity the state our central governments were not able to meet the needs of the people of affected area still the people are dying of the implications social medical as well as economic implications of that natural calamity so it is very disheartening that one of the threat is natural calamity the second threat is migrations 
as we all know that migration in India is taking place in large numbers and it could be seen the ugly scene of the migrations if we visit the railway stations during the Holi or Durga Puja or any other festival which are being celebrated in India. Thousands and lakhs of the people are thronged into the platform and they are being sandwiched in the general compartment of the train like vegetables and animals and they travel in the same conditions from one station to another and they migrate from their hometown to major cities. So when an individual migrates from his hometown to cities, he loses many factors. He loses the shelter, he loses the social security, he loses the family protections. And we all were aware of this fact. The deaths and killings of the workers from Bihar and Jharkhand in the different parts of the country are being reported. Many people, they sleep on the pavement. A drunken driver in the late night thrust and kill the workers those who are homeless. It comes in the newspaper quite often and you might have read. There is a local community. They also target the migratory laborers in different parts of the country on the name of regional identity. Why an individual migrates from his hometown or home city or home state to other, other areas? It is sheer lack of opportunities, job opportunities. Our the political or socio-economic situations are not conducive for an individual to adjust and run his family. So in a very incompulsive situations, they migrate from the hometown to other part of the country. So another threat for informal sector is migrations. Third major threat which has recently been visualized is the factor of globalizations, liberalization or privatizations. The symptoms which are being seen in this country could be easily identified. You might have seen the reliance, the biggest private sector in India is selling vegetables. Many other companies, they have come in the field to sell the green vegetables which was one of the prime areas of the informal workers, urban vendors. Not only the vegetables, but other necessary items which are being sold by the informal workers through their families and they, 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 their economy was based on that contributions, which was being also hijacked by the major companies of India. This is one symptom which might have seen in India, which is taking place at large scale. How is it possible that uh, almost 
negligible in terms of economic capacity can meet the challenge of multi-billion company like Reliance and other. So who is to be blamed? When we talk about the social security, when we talk about the welfare of this country, the welfare of this country that advocates about equal distributions of income. As we can see and read our constitutions, it describes this fact that the concentration of wealth should not be in the hands of the few. The Gandhian ideology also advocates the same fact. But what happened after 60 to 63 years since independence. The line from poor to rich is getting larger and murkier. The rich are becoming richer and the poor are becoming more poorer. It has generated a number of social evils as well. The pity crimes in the cities and the problems of nationalism in the different parts of the country is also a symptom of this system. When an individual feels that this state does not exist for me, this state does not do anything for me, and the primary responsibility of the state is to provide economic as well as, well as social security to each and every individual of this country, to the last man of the village. It has not been done. It is not taking place. They remain at the risk. Medical facilities for them, if they are capable of meeting the price of the medicines or the price of the treatment, those who are only likely to be treated in the hospitals. Forget about the kind of the medical system which are existing in the country could be easily visualized. The kind of the educational system which are cropping up in the last few years could be easily visualized. The schools which are run by the government, PWD and other, you can see the building, we can go and inside the schools and they, 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 the schools are in the cities which has the media glaze and other so they are a bit conscious if you go to the villages where the where the children of the workers they study their situations are really pathetic while interacting with one of the laborer in Jharkhand I I Ask him, why don't you send your five children to the school? He said politely that, why should I send my children to the schools? I did. My oldest son was in school for three years. And next to my oldest son, he was also in school for almost three years. But in the three complete years, they were unable to learn even the basic alphabets in Hindi or in English. Forget about a proper education. Even they failed to learn 
alphabet. Then why do I send my children to this school? If they remain at home, they can contribute me or their mother in generating incomes for the family. So this is the existing social and economic structures which are taking place in India. Whether it is the educational system, or is it the medical system, or any other system which covers the largest section of the society. So the concept of the welfare state, the concept where the state intervenes, where the state takes the responsibility of meeting the basic needs of the people are largely largely being ignored. And it has not even the schemes were being made, it has not been very successful. It has not been translated into action. So this is a very pathetic conditions for the informal sectors of this country. There are a number of very disturbing data. One of the data is more than 80% electricity of this country is being consumed by less than 10% population of this country. Almost 80-25% power is being used by the city dwellers, those who live in luxury, those who run three to four ACs in their one house. And there are a number of people, those who been, do not have the kerosene oil to lighten up their dark houses. So these are the social and economic situations of the larger section of the society. Now, how, who, who are the people who have been addressing this problem? There are a number of international organizations, there are a number of national organizations. They have targeted to alleviate the status of the poorer section of the society. They also tried to motivate the civil society organization to look into their problems and try to solve them. And one of the very interesting and successful story for the informal sector, which has taken place also in India and in Bangladesh, that is the Grameen Bank. Professor Yunus, Nobel laureate, you might have been aware of this name, what he, what he did. And it was a magical uh, uh, wave which enwrapped a larger section of the workers of the society. What he has evolved, the system of microfinance. What is microfinance? If an individual earns maybe 120 rupees in a day, then he is supposed to save, deposit at least 10 rupees every day to, through a cooperative to a particular bank. And in this group, the group is being divided maybe into 10 to 12 people. So the responsibility of one group leader is to accumulate the 10 rupees from all his 10 uh, fellow beings and deposit it to at the bank. And likewise, hundreds of that kind of group is being made. So what happens? A large amount is being collected from the same people for which this scheme was being made. And when the need arises for a particular individual or a 
family the amount is being given to that individual or family as we all aware of this fact that money lenders in in in, in india are wide spread they exploit the poorer extremely till 80s there was no formal bank which were willing to lend the informal sector into their system because they do not have the economic security and nobody was willing to become the partner or become the guarantor of the informal workers so they perceive that he may take the money from the bank and may not be in a position to deposit it in the requisite time so bank will be at loss so they were not in the chain of the formal financing system but this microfinance a new initiative innovative ideas were being uh, implemented in the different parts of the country and india also the seva self employed women associations has developed and now the many organizations in different states are working on this formula they are creating self help group a group of 10 to 12 people and that kind of uh, group hundreds of group are being made and they developed a cooperatives and through the cooperatives they they generate incomes and that income is being used for the benefit of that particular family or individual and they also lend that individual who need the money at the lowest interest rate so here the protection is being created the this protection is being created not by the state by among themselves through the coordinations of a civil society organizations so this is one one of the component which is being addressed but what is the role of the state is it possible that civil society organization can meet this kind of huge demands of the 90% workers of this country it is not and that is why you might have heard about narega now it has been converted into marega scheme was started and this scheme was started because the most important factor of the informal sector is the lack of opportunities is the lack of job they do not have job and that is why the problem begins from there and it covers many other part of the their uh, lives so social insecurity medical insecurity and other natural calamities the many other factors which come and include into their grief and sorrows and that increase in volumes so if they have the proper safety net of getting the job at the right time and consistently then their half of the problem is being solved so narega is an was an attempt and it has been a number of case studies in spite of the the way system is being regulated and the system is being implemented in the different parts of the country a different kind of reports talk about the different problems there was a mis- there was a, some malpractices are being involved but more or less this scheme is hugely debated and realized by the expert that it has definitely an attempt to address the basic problems <coughs> of the informal workers but if we talk about their other parts of the security then where are the states when we are in the formal sectors wherever we work whether it is the government run or autonomous bodies or the public sector or private sector there is 
coverage of risk. If any accident takes place, a certain amount will be given to the dependent of the family. But does it happen to the informal workers? If they die on the road while crossing, there is no amount is being paid to that dependent of the individual. So the bed earner's death cultivates miseries and problems for the complete family. And they are extremely vulnerable. So these are, these are the factors, these are the loopholes, these are the prevalent threat which need to be addressed to, add, to, to identify and mitigate the 90 percent or more than 90 percent workforce of this country that is in the informal sectors. If we compare the data of Indian data with the other Western countries, we can very easily identify that their positions, their conditions are much better than what we have in India. Even Sub-Saharan Africa, where the poverty is much more than in India, the conditions of the informal workers are not as pathetic as we do, we have. We have the pathetic condition because of the certain reasons as, as we uh, uh, try to identify. One is the corruption, as we all know that when the large amount of the schemes of any uh, social welfare is being misutilized from the top hierarchy of the bureaucratic system, then the targeted groups take a very minimal amount of that schemes, whether it is any insurance schemes for welfare of the children or women. So corruption is one of the uh, uh, corrupt practices, is one of the uh, main um, problems in translating the government schemes of the informal sector. The second, globalization has become another threat. The kind of new jobs is being developed in the last few years that make the informal workers out of the race. Vegetable vendors, which I have given you an example, is one, one example where the vendors used to sell door-to-door -door green vegetables, which was being hijacked by the largest pub, uh, uh, private sector of this country, Reliance and many other companies. So their job, they became jobless. Likewise, in many other sectors where the skill is needed, where their new ideas are being developed, illiterate, uneducated, informal workers, they feel misfit in this race. So globalization has become another important threat for the informal workers. Natural calamities, as we discuss, has become another threat for the informal workers. When, whenever earthquake takes place, whenever the flood takes place, it almost eliminates the existing system of the poorer section of the society. And it takes years to recoup from the natural calamities. So these are the threat perceptions of the informal workers which come under the informal sector, which consist more than 90% population of the country. So in, in summary, we can analyze with the welfare, the concept of the welfare state. 
the constitution makers, those who try to evolve that, concentration of wealth should not be in the hands of the few. There should be a proper line. And Gandhian philosophy advocates the same. So, right-based approach of the state is being thought of by these constitution makers. Ki those who want to have the work, the state must provide them work at the same time economic and social security to the extremely poorer section of the society. But unfortunately, it has not taken place in the last 63 years. And there is once again need to see the grey areas in which this informal sector is being run. We will discuss later the Social Security Act of 2008, how it has been an attempt to address the informal workers at large. Thank you. So one way we can say that uh, informal sector has given security to economy of the country, any country where uh, they are working because number are growing, but they are themselves Very, insecure. They are definitely. So, uh, not only in India, but other parts of the country as well, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, even the developing uh, societies. The major chunk of the economy is based on the informal workers. The Indian percentage is much higher, it is more than 90%. So, uh, if the 90% population of the country is not being addressed by the proper schemes of the government, of the central as well as the state, then definitely the, the, the signing India, the concept of signing India, is uh, a, a, a misnomer and uh, it, it does not appeal to the people of this country. So, well, friends, as you know that uh, they are more insecure, but the government are taking a steps and uh, Social Security Act and different measures have been taken in the past and more are in pipelines. So, I hope uh, in coming uh, years the situation will improve and uh, something good can be done for the people uh, uh, working in informal sector, uh, as an informal way. So with this, we would like to conclude the lecture and I thank all of you for watching the lecture and on your behalf, I thank Dr. Satish Kumar for giving such an insightful lecture on this very topic. Thank you very much.